Hello there! In this tutorial, we are going to be creating Snake in Godot. And I will be going through these steps to achieve the entire thing. And I do expect that you already know the basics of Godot. If you don't, check out these videos to get you started on the basics. And to start this entire thing off, let's start talking about how the game is going to work on a logical level. And there are three main steps that we have to cover. The first one is that we have to create a grid. And for that, I'm going to use a tile map. And usually tile maps are used to lay out a level, but they are actually quite flexible and you can use them for lots of different purposes, which is what we are going to do. And once we have the grid, we are going to look at every single cell inside of this grid. And then we're either going to measure what's inside or we are going to place something inside there. And what we are going to place in there is either a part of our snake or the apple. And our snake is actually just an array of different grids that we put together. And then we're moving these points in certain time intervals. Super easy, actually. And then we come to the third part, that we are going to add proper graphics. And for that, we are going to look at the snake and compare each part of the snake relative to the rest of the body. So for example, when we look at the hat, we look at the item before it, and from that relation, we determine what direction the hat has to face in. And really, the only fundamental concept you have to understand is how to use code to influence tile maps. So before we get into the actual game, Let's first play around with that for a little bit. I think that's going to be quite useful. All right, so here we are in an empty scene of Godot. Nothing is happening right now. The only thing is that I already imported a couple of files. So I have a font, I have a couple of graphics, and I have one sound file. Nothing spectacular. And before we start with the tile maps, I first want to resize our window so that we have a square. So for that, I go to Project Settings, I scroll down to window and I went with 800 by 800 so that we have a proper square. And now I close it and there we go. We have a bluish square. Cool. And to get started, I want to create a basic node that I'm going to call, let's call it main game. And as a child of this, I'm going to add a tile map. And this tile map is going to hold both our snake and our apple. So let's call it snake apple, although it's not the greatest name, but well, it's fine, I guess. And this snake apple is going to get two tile sets. So let me create them. So on the right, I go to tile set and new tile set, and then I click on it again, and we get to our tile set editor. And there I'm going to start with the snake sprite sheet. So I just drag it in, and there you can see our snake. So let me zoom in a little bit. And this thing we are going to separate into separate different parts. So for that, I'm going to create a new atlas. And I'm going to click on snapping, and then I select the entire region. And right now you're going to realize that the tile set doesn't line up properly. So especially when you look at the head, for example, it's split into four different parts. So we have to adjust a couple of things. The first one is the step size. So it's going to be 40 and 40. Oh yeah, and these graphics are all 40 pixels by 40 pixels just to mention that. And then for the subtitle size, this also has to be 40 and 40. And once we have that, now this entire thing lines up perfectly fine. And now I can reselect the region, and this is looking much better. Cool. And we could change the icon for this just to make it look a bit nicer, and let's go with this one. And that's pretty much it. So now I can deselect it and go back here, and we have our snake dot sprite sheet. And there's one important thing. Right now we look at the name, you can see snake underscore sprite sheet dot png and followed by a zero. That zero is going to become important later on. But we'll come to that in a bit. But now we can, like any tile set, just pick up a different part of this and draw something with it. And I can just pick different elements and draw them on the screen. There's one thing I forgot, that right now our tiles are too large. So I go to cell in the inspector, and change this to 40 times 40. And now this is working much better. So the one tile that I have used as a basic block for now is this one, and we can just use it to just paint all over the entire thing. And this is how you would create a basic setup for a level, that you just pick up random items from this, and you build different levels from it, which works super well. But I don't want to do any of that. Uh, okay, went a bit too far back. 
So I don't want to place any of these elements randomly on the screen. I want to use code to put them in very specific positions. And for that, I first give our main game a script. And I want it to be empty and the rest can stay as it is. So I click on create. And now I want to go with func underscore ready. So just to get it tested, that whenever this scene is ready, I want to do a certain thing. And now we can actually talk about using code to influence a tile map. And there are a couple of methods that are really useful. So let me just create a test variable that I call var test. And in that, we're going to store something, we are going to print once the scene is ready. So the most basic one, if I target my tile map, would be get cell. And into this, you have to place an X and a Y. So let's just go with zero and zero, which will be the top left coordinate. And now if I save the entire scene as main game, I can run this and let's see what happens. In the output, we get minus one, which is shorthand for this cell is empty. But what we could be doing now, if I go back to it, and let's just fill it with this one for now. So the top left one, this is going to be zero and zero. And if you look at the bottom of the viewport, you can actually see zero and zero. That's the coordinate. So if I go down, we can see a preview of what's in there. So now if we run this entire thing again, and I look at output, we get zero. And this zero is the same zero that we got for the snake here. So we know that on this position, we have the first tile set, which is going to be super useful. And actually, let me add the second tile set. So if I reopen the tile set, I want to create a second one with the apple.png. It is create a new atlas, select it, and that's all we needed. So now I can go out of it again. And now you can see we have our snake with zero and the apple with one. So now if I place the apple in this position, and now if we were to run this again, I would expect one as the output. And let's try it. And there we go, we have one. So this is the easiest way to measure something in the tile map. So this is already quite useful. What we can also do, and let me add a couple more tiles. And let me actually make a little snake so that we have a bit more to look at. So now we have a snake and we have an apple. And what I want to do now is to find all the cells that are being used. And for that, we can get get used cells. And if I run this, we can get all the different cells that are being used. So this is also quite useful. And to make this even better, I can change this to get used cells by ID. And now if I were to pass in zero, we will get our snake. And if we were to pass in one, we would get our apple. And let's try this. So I just want the apple, so one, and I run this again. And this should give us zero and zero because the apple is in the top left. And we get that, cool. So with that, we have two ways to get all the cells we need to find. So this is a really good start. So with that, we can talk about how to set a cell instead of just getting the information. So let me get rid of the print statement. And instead of getting a cell, I want to set a cell, which is called set cell. And in here, we have to pass in a couple of arguments. The first one is the x and the y coordinate. So in my case, I'm going to go with zero and zero. Next up, we have to give the ID of the tile set we want to use. So if I pass in zero, we will get the snake. If I passed in one, we will get the apple. And for now, let's go with zero because I want to use the snake. Next up, we have three more arguments that are called flip x, flip y, and transpose. For now, I'm going to set all of them to false because we are not going to use them. But they are effectively used to rotate the tile around in its place, which we are going to use more later on. But for now, don't worry about it. And finally, we have one more argument that is called auto tile coordinate. And this one would allow us to select a certain tile from this tile set. But for now, I'm going to leave it empty. And actually, this doesn't have to be stored in a variable, so I can just get rid of this. And just to make this a bit clearer, 
Let me get rid of the entire tile set so we know exactly what's going to happen. So now I have an empty tile set, but when I run the code, we see in the top left the one tile we have set via the code once the scene is ready. And since we didn't specify a specific subtile, we are always going to get the top left tile in this tile set, which in my case is a tail that points to the left. But what I can do now, if I go back to my code, I can set a subtile set, which has to be a vector 2. And in here, we have to pass in an x and a y. And let me explain how this is going to work. And this is best explained by going back into our scene, and I still have my tile set open. So in here, you can see two rows, one and two, and then lots of columns. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different columns. And in the vector we just created, the x is going to target the column, and the y is going to target the row. So for example, zero and zero would be the first item. But if we passed in 1 and 0, so x1, y0, we will go to this cell here. And let's actually try this. So for now, let's just pass in 0 and 0, which should not make any change. And we still got a tail pointing to the left. Cool. But now, let's change x to 1. And now, we get a tail pointing in the other direction. And to make this a bit more clear, Let's go with 2 and 0, and this should give us the head. And there we go, we have the head pointing to the right. Which is, if I go back to the tile set, we have x, 0, 1, and 2, and for y it's just going to be 0. So this way we can put any kind of tile on the map. And with that, we have all the basics we need to make this game work. So let's start placing the apple randomly on the screen. And the logic for this is super simple. All we need is to create two random numbers for x and y, and then use those two numbers to place the apple randomly somewhere on our map. So let's go straight into our code and let's take care of this. So here I am where I left off just a second ago. And I'm going to go back into my code. And I am for now just going to get rid of all of this. So I'm just going to put pass in here, so Godot doesn't freak out about error messages. And before I go into the other parts, I first want to create some constants. For now, the snake is going to be 0, and constant apple is going to be 1. And this is just going to make it a little bit clearer later on when I select specific tile sets, which tile set we are working with. And that's all that's happening here. And besides that, since I have to use the apple position quite a bit, I also want to make this a variable. So let's call it apple. Pause. And I am just going to leave it empty. However, once the scene is ready, I want to place this apple. So I'm going to create apple pause is going to get a return value from a function I call place apple. So let's create that function. So func place apple. It doesn't need any arguments. And in here, I want to create a var x and a var y, which are both going to be random numbers. And to create a random number, we need rand i. But I don't want any random number. I want a random number between 0 and 20. And 20 I got from, let me open my time up again. So our entire window right now is 800 pixels wide and 800 pixels high. And each of these cells is 40 pixels high and 40 pixels wide. And if we divide 800 by 40, we get 20. So this is going to be the maximum amount of cells we have. And the entire game is going to be static, although you could make this more responsive quite easily, but that's not the point of this tutorial. So I am just going to keep it static and just use integers. So both get rand i mod 20. So that both x and y is going to be a random number between 0 and 20. And to not get the same numbers every time, I am going to add the randomize method. And all this one does is that make sure that we don't get the same random number every time we run the game, which would look quite weird. And now that we have that, all we have to do is to return a vector 2 that has the x and the y coordinate. So every time this ready method is being run, our apple position is going to get a random vector with an x and a y position. 
So now I can close this method because we are not going to use it for a little bit. And I'm also going to create another function that I'm going to call draw apple. So this draw apple actually takes this apple position and puts an apple on the screen. And all this one has to do is to target our snake apple and set cell. And in here, I need apple pause.x, apple pause.y. So the numbers we created in this place apple. Then I want to get the tile set apple. And that's pretty much all we needed. So now we have a draw apple function that does all it needs to do. And for now, let's just call this draw apple in our ready function. So draw apple. And let's see if this is working. So we get an apple on the screen. Cool. And let's try it again. And there we go. Now we have a different apple. And one more time, just to be sure. Now we have an apple in a different position. Nice. So this is already a basic start. With very few lines of code, we can place an apple randomly on our screen. And with that covered, let's take care of our snake. And for now, we are just going to draw a static snake. The movement is going to come in the next part. And the drawing of the snake works really similar compared to the apple. With the only difference now is that we don't have a single position we want to place. Instead, we are going to have an array with multiple positions. And we really just cycle through all of them and draw each of these points. And that's pretty much it. It's surprisingly simple. So let's jump right into our code and let's take care of this. Here I'm back in my basic setup and I want to go back straight into my code. And for now, I want to create a new variable that I'm going to call snake body. And this snake body is going to store all the parts of our snake. So it is going to store quite a few different vector two positions. And just to get it started, I want to give it a couple of points. So I start with vector two, and now we need an X and a Y position, very much like the apple we created earlier, or the apple position more specifically. And I went with five on the X and 10 on the Y. So it's roughly in the middle of the screen, but moved slightly to the left. And this would be the head of our snake. So next up, I create another vector two. It is going to be four on the X and 10 on the Y. So this position of the snake is one field further to the left than the head. And let me copy the entire thing and give it one more position, this time three. And let me properly assign it to the variable. All right. So all I have to do now is take each of these points and draw them. So let me minimize all of this and create a new function that I call func draw snake. And this function later on is going to become quite massive because it will draw lots of different graphics. But for now, just to get the basic logic working, I just want to draw a plain block for every part of the snake. It's not going to look great, but we're going to take care of the looks later on. So really all I want to do in here is for, let's call it block in snake body. I want to get my snake apple tile map. I am really starting to regret the naming here, but anyway, set cell. And now I need a couple of arguments. The first one is the X and the Y on the tile map. And this one is going to be block.x and block.y. So we take, let's say this first vector, this is going to be this block, and then we take the X and the Y of this to place it. And the tile set we want to use is the one for snake. And this right now is going to give us, let me open it again. So if we left the code like this, we would only get the snake tail pointing to the left, which I don't want. What I want is this plain block all the way to the right. And to target this, I have to, let's say, add in faults for X flip, Y flip, and transpose. And for the auto tile coordinate, I'm going to add a vector two. And I believe this one had eight and zero. Oh, and it is vector two. Did I forget something? No, looks good. And let's actually try this. So once our scene is ready, besides draw apple, 
I also want to draw our snake. And let's see if this is working. All right, there we go. We have the basic parts of our snake. Let me close it. And with that covered, we can actually start talking about moving the snake. So let's work on that. And this is the part where we get really interesting logic. So let me talk about how to move the snake. Right now, our snake has three different points. 510, 410, and 310. And let's say I want to move this snake one cell further to the right. To achieve that, I have to take the head and move it one cell further to the right. Then I have to take the cell in the middle and move it where the head used to be. Then I take the third cell and move it where the second cell used to be. And that way, we have moved the entire snake one cell further to the right. And this process we are going to do really often, about five times per second. And here's how this is going to work in code. We start by creating a copy of our snake body, but this isn't going to be a perfect copy because when we copy it, we only copy all the elements besides the last one. So every time we do this, we remove the last part of the snake. And to make up for this, we are going to create a new cell at the beginning of the snake. And this new cell is going to be the sum of the previously first item in our snake body plus the direction the snake is supposed to go in. And the direction is going to be set by the player. And this we are going to cover later on. For now, we would just suppose our snake is moving to the right. And that's really all we needed. So now let's actually implement it. And the very first thing I want to do is to maximize the code editor so we have a bit more space. Cool. Now I want to create a new function that I called move snake. It doesn't need any arguments, so let's jump right in. And the first thing I want to do is to create a body copy of our snake. So I want my snake body, and I want to take a slice, which is done with the slice method. And in here, we need two arguments. The first one is the index we want to start on, which in my case is zero, because I want to start right at the beginning. But then, we want to go all the way to the end, minus one. So we take the entire snake body besides the last element. And unfortunately, we can't just write minus one. Godot doesn't support that. Instead, what I have to do is snake body dot size. And this would give us the number of items inside of this list. And then I have to go minus two. And the minus two here is important because we start counting from zero. So if we wanted the entire list, we would have snake body dot size minus one, but we want all the elements besides the last one. So it has to be minus two. But all right, now we have a copy of our snake besides the last element. So now we have gotten rid of the tail. And to make up for this, we have to create a new head. So I create a variable new head. And for this one, I want to get my body copy and get the first element in there. So the one with index zero. And towards this one, I want to add a snake direction, which is also going to be a vector. And this is going to move this first element into a specific direction. And we haven't created this one yet. So let's do that. So bar snake direction. And this is later going to be determined by the player input. But for now, I just want to make this a vector two and let's say one and zero. So this means it would move to the right. And that's pretty much all we needed. So all we have to do now is take our body copy and insert our new hat in there. And I want it to be inserted at index zero. So right at the beginning, and I want my new hat. And this is the entire logic we needed that I talked about just a second ago. We start by creating our original snake body and copy all the elements besides the last one. So effectively, we are going to get rid of the tail. And to make up for that, we use these two lines where we are going to create a new head that moves our snake in a new direction. And now all we have to do is I want to get my snake body back and set this to body copy. So that way we can keep on working with our snake body and not have to work with a different variable. And all right, this is all we needed, except there's one more thing. Because we don't want to call this function once, we want to call it multiple times. 
So we have to find some way to call this function lots of times. And to do that, I just went with a basic timer. So I just click a timer and I call this snake tick. And here for the wait time, I went with 0 0.2. And this is supposed to be auto start, but not one shot. And then every time this triggers, I want to send a signal on snake tick timeout, and this is connected to our main game. Cool. So every time this one ticks, I want to call move snake. And what I can do as well now, I can take draw apple and draw snake and also place them inside here. So we keep on drawing them and updating them as well later on. And let's actually try this and see if it works. So now you can see we have a movement, but the movement kind of has a problem. So our snake keeps on growing, but this isn't because the vector doesn't work. The vector keeps on having just three elements. The reason why our snake is growing is because we don't delete the old cells. So what we have to do every time before we move our snake, we have to delete all the snake tiles. So what I want to do before all of the movement happens, delete tiles and snake. Now, right now, this function doesn't exist and Godot is going to give me an error. So let me copy the name and create this function. So func delete tiles, and this one does need an argument. It needs the ID. And this one is supposed to be an integer. And all I want to do in here is to get all the cells of a certain ID, so either the snake or the apple, and delete all of them. So I'm going to start by creating a new variable that I call cells. And to get all the cells, all I need is our snake apple, dot get used cells by ID and pass in the ID we pass into. So whatever we pass into delete tiles is also going to be deleted, which in this case is going to be snake. But this one right now is only going to give us all the used cells, so we don't delete them. This is going to come now. Because what I want to do is for cell in cells, then I want to target my snake apple again. And to delete cells, we are still going to use set cell. And we target the vector we are going to get from the cell, so cell x and cell.y. But what we can do now is pass in a negative one for the tile set ID. And if this is negative one, we are just going to get rid of whatever is in this tile. So really, all that we are doing in this function is we first get all the different cells by a certain ID. And then we tell Godot to delete all the cells inside of this tile set. And now this should be working. So let's try. And there we go. We have a snake moving to the right. So this is looking much better. But obviously we can't move it. So let's work on that. So in this section, we are going to give the player the ability to control the snake. And really all we're going to do is to influence the snake direction we created earlier by using the input method. And this is quite easy to do. Let's jump right back into Godot and let's take care of this. So here I'm back in my code and I want to create a new function that covers any kind of player input. So underscore input event. And this function is going to be triggered every time the player makes any kind of input. And what I want to do in here is if input is action just pressed. And I will just keep with the predefined one. And let's start with UI up. So if the player is going to press up, I want to get my snake direction, this one, and set this to vector to the x is going to be zero and the y is going to be minus one because we want to move upwards. And let me actually move both of them on the same line so it's a bit easier to read. And now all I have to do is copy this thing four times and change the different directions. So this is going to be right, this is going to be left, and this is going to be down. 
So for right, we go with one and zero. For left, we're going to go with minus one and zero. And then for UI down, this is going to be zero and one. And that's pretty much it. So now, whenever we create a new head, instead of just moving the snake to the right, we move it wherever the player last pressed the button. So let's actually try this. So game is still running, that's a good start. But now if I press up, my snake is moving up. And this is working in all the different directions. Cool, so now we have a moving snake. Now obviously this isn't perfect yet, because I can move the snake backwards, basically. Which, well, would break the game quite fast if it actually was a usable game. We also can't touch the apple, but all of that is going to come later. For now, I'm quite happy with this. So with that covered, let's give our snake the ability to eat the apple. And once we're doing that, our snake is supposed to grow by one cell. And the logic here is surprisingly simple, because we only require two bits of information and we have both of them. So first off, we need the position of the apple, and this we have, it's a vector 2. And second, we need the head of our snake, which we can also get, it's just the first element in our snake body. And really all we have to do is check if both of these are equal to each other, and if that's the case, our snake has eaten the apple. And for now, if that happens, I just want to put the apple in a different position. Growing the snake happens afterwards. So here I'm back in my code. And let me scroll down a bit and let's create a new function here. So I want to create a new function that I'm going to call check apple eaten. Potentially not the greatest name, but well, it's fine. In here, I want to check if apple pos is equal to snake body and we just want to check the first index oh and i have to use a proper comparison operator and then we're good to go so if this statement is true we know the head of our snake is in the same position as the apple which basically means our snake is eating the apple and if that is the case i want to get my apple pause again and again place the apple which is the function we have created earlier, right in the beginning, this part here. And all this function is doing is it creates random positions and places the apple. So we don't have to write anything new here, because this function just places the apple in a new position. So now all we have to do is on our timeout function is also called check apple eaten. And let's try this and see what happens. So the game is still starting, that's a good start. And I missed the apple. Cool. And nice. This is working pretty well. So we get our apple in a new position every time. So this part is working. But obviously, this doesn't really target the main requirement of the game because we want to grow the snake. And we already have most of the code. Let me explain what's going to happen. So far, every time we moved our snake, we got rid of the tail and moved the head one cell further in whatever direction we wanted to go in. And now to grow our snake, for one tick of our game, we are not going to get rid of the tail, but we are still going to add a new head. And that way our snake is going to grow by one cell. And that's really it, let's actually implement it. And let me go all the way to the top because I want to create a new variable. And this variable I call add apple. And by default, it is going to be false. And now when I move our snake, I only want to do this if add apple, let's say, let's keep it simple. So I only want to do this if add apple is false. And if that's not the case, I want to do this. So if add apple is true, I'm going to copy all of this. And now literally the only change I have to make is to change this from minus two to minus one. So now we are actually copying the entire list and adding a new head to it. And that way we're adding a new cell to the snake. But we are only going to do this for one tick of our game. So once this has run once, I want to set add apple 
back to false. And then when we eat the apple, so back here, I would decide add apple to true. And I think that's all we needed. Let's try. So we have our moving snake, we get an apple, and our snake is growing. Nice. Let me try one more. And I think this is working really well. So that way we have already the basics of our game. So with that covered, let's talk about failed states that we are actually able to lose our game. And let's talk about all the possibilities that could lead to a failure state. The easiest one is if we're moving too far to the left, to the right, up or down. So if that happens, we want to end the game. Also, we want to end the game if the snake overlaps with itself. And right now, this could happen for two different reasons. One is that the snake bites its own tail, or that the player is moving in reverse. So we have to cover both of these. And we already have all the information we need to cover all of this. So I think it's best to jump right into our code and let's take care of this. So here I'm back in my code and I want to create a new function that I'm going to call check game over. And the first thing I want to do, because I want to check the head of our snake quite often, I'm going to create a new variable that is going to be the snake head. So snake body zero, just to save me some writing. And now we have to cover two different failure states. The first one is snake leaves the screen. And the second one would be snake bites its own tail. So let's start with snake leaves the screen. That one's the easier one. And really, all we have to check is if head.x is either greater than 20 or head.x is smaller than zero. So if we're going too far to the right or too far to the left, then the game is going to be over. But we also have to check up and down. So our head.y is smaller than zero or head.y is greater than 20. So if any of these conditions is true, we know our snake has left the screen. And what happens then? Let's say I want to reset the game, which is a function we haven't created yet, but that comes in just a second. Actually, let's do it right now. Because Godot is incredibly annoying about any kind of mistake. So all I really want to do in here is that if we have a game over state, I want to reset our snake. So put it back into the original position. So I go all the way to the top and just copy these vector positions. And then I just want to take our snake body and give it the original vector positions again. So that way we're going to put our snake back into its original position and get rid of all the extra bodies we have added to it. And along with that, I want to get my snake direction. And by default, I want to set this to vector two, two, one, and zero. So that by default, our snake is moving to the right. And now all I have to do is to copy check game over and call it in our timeout function. And let's try this. So I just going to move it outside of the screen. And well, we are getting a game over. Although what I don't really like about it is that if we're moving outside, our snake is going to move quite a bit further. And the main reason for that is that this snake timeout function is only called every 200 milliseconds. So what I can do instead is to create func underscore process and check our game over state in there. And if I run this now, we are checking our fail state much faster. So with that, we can start working on the second part, that the snake bites its own tail. And this one is also quite simple to achieve. So what I want to do is for block in snake body. But I don't want to check the entire snake body. Instead, I only want to take a slice. And now I want the entire snake body besides the head, 
because I already have the head and I want to compare the head in relation to the rest of the body. So this is going to be one and snake body dot size minus one. So what's happening in here is that we look at every block of our snake besides the head. So we are starting at the first index and then we go all the way to the end of the snake. And in here, all we have to check is if block is equal to our head. And if that's the case, I just want to reset our game again. And let me try this. And all I have to do is to move backwards. So now we can see I can reset our snake because we're moving inside of the snake. But I could also play this for a second and try it that way. So this is working quite well, nice. So the last thing we have to cover for this part is that when we get player input, so this entire section here, we can't reverse, which is very easy to add because all I have to check is if we're going upwards, then we can't go downwards. So I have to add another if statement. So if not snake direction is equal to vector two, and zero and one. And only if that is the case, our snake direction can change. So there are three steps to make the snake direction work. We first check for player input. Right now, this is the player pressing up. And then if the player is pressing up, we are checking if the player is not moving downwards. And only if that is not the case, then we set the snake direction to go upwards. And this logic we have to apply to all of them. So let me copy this line. And now we want to go right. So our snake direction cannot be left, which is minus one. Then we have snake left. And in here, our snake direction cannot be right. So this is going to be one and zero. And finally, if we are going down, our snake cannot be moving upwards. So this would be minus one. And that should cover it. So let's try. So our snake is still working and I'm pressing to the left right now or I'm pressing down right now, but we can't move in that direction. But the rest of the controls still work perfectly well. Cool. So with that, we have the really basic parts of a snake game. And with that part covered, we can talk about making the game look a bit nicer. And this is going to be the most complex part of this entire tutorial. So let's go through it really, really slowly. What we are going to do is we are going to cycle for each part of the snake and compare each bit with the bit before and after it. And then depending on the relationship with the neighbors, we are going to place a specific kind of graphic. So for example, for our head, if the next block is to the left, we know our head has to face to the right. Or if we are in the middle of the snake, if there's a block below and to the right of a block, then this block has to be a curve that goes right and down. But since there are quite a few different possibilities, we are going to end up with lots of different if statements. So let's go through it slowly and I explain why we implement it. So here we are back in the code and I have minimized all the functions besides draw snake because this is where all the graphic stuff is going to happen. And let me comment out this part for now because we are going to replace the entire thing. And what I want to do in here is to cycle for every block of the snake. So you could go for block in snake body. However, that would not work because besides the block of the snake, we also want to know the index of this block because the index could be used to find the neighbors of this block. And unfortunately, Godot does not have an enumerate method. So this one wouldn't be working. But instead what we can do is for let's call it block index in snake body dot size. So this way our block index would just be zero, one, and two. And then we can create a new variable that is called block. And this block is going to be snake body and the index is going to be block index. And now I could actually let me copy the previous one. So this is the drawing we had earlier. And let me run off this to see if it's working. And yeah, we get the exact same result. 
So this one is still working quite well. Nice. But now I don't want to draw all of these elements anymore. Instead, I want to draw individual elements. So for example, I want to target the head or the tail. And let's actually start with the head. And targeting the head is really easy because the head is always the very first element. So all we have to do is if block index is equal to zero. And if that is the case, we know we have the head. And in here, we have to figure out what the relation between the head and the next block is going to be. So for that, I'm going to create a new variable that I call head direction or head dear, just to keep it a bit shorter. And for this one, I'm going to create a new function that I call relation two. And this is just checking the relationship between two vectors. And it's supposed to check snake body zero, so the head itself, and snake body one, so the next block. So let's create this function. So func relation two, and I want a first block that is going to be a vector two, and then a second block, which is also going to be a vector two. And now all I have to do in here is to subtract one vector from the other. And I call this block relation. And really all we have to do is get the second block minus the first block. And this is going to give us a vector that points in one of four directions. It could be one, zero, minus one, zero, zero, one, and zero minus one, depending on how these blocks relate to each other. So for example, if the head of our snake is in position five and 10, and the second block is at position five and four, then we can subtract the first one from the second one, and then we get minus one and zero. And this would tell us that the second block is to the left. And with that, all we have to do is if block relation is equal to vector two, and let's go with zero and minus one, and if that is the case, I want to return left. And now we have to do the entire thing for all the four blocks. Oh, sorry. This is supposed to be minus one and zero. So now let's say if this is one and zero, this would be right. If this is zero and one, this would be bottom and zero and minus one, this would be, let's call it top. So all that's happening in here is that we are subtracting one vector from the other. And this is going to tell us where these blocks are in relation to each other. And now in our draw snake function, we can use that information. So if head dear is equal to right, then I want to get my snake apple tile map and I want to set the cell. And now X and Y and the tile set is going to stay the same. Actually, all of them are going to stay the same, at least for now. Let's just copy the entire thing. So for this entire block, we know that this is supposed to be the head facing to the right. So what we can do now, instead of taking this plain rectangle, let me open the tile map again. So right now we're taking this piece, but now we want to take the head facing to the right. So this would be two and zero. And two and zero. And that's pretty much all we have to do. All I have to do now is to copy this line for each of the different directions. So let me copy it four times. And now I want to look at if my head is facing left, up, or down. And now to pick the different graphics, we can go on two different routes. We could either select a different kind of vector. So for example, vector left instead of two and zero would be three and one. So this would be one way to approach it. Or we could just flip the entire thing in the X direction. So I could just set this to true and we would have the same outcome. Both would work just fine. It's really up to you what you want to go for. And then for up, let me look at it again. So this one would be four and zero. And we just have to flip it in the y direction. So this would be four and zero. 
and then this would be true. And then for down, we would just have to take four and zero. And that is all we need for the head. Let's try this now. Let's hope it's working. And it is not. Ah, and the reason is quite simple. That right now we are drawing all of this, but then we are drawing this on top. So I only want to get this line here if none of this is true. So now let's try it again. And there we go. Something has gone wrong a tiny bit, which I think is quite useful to illustrate the principle. So for now, we know that going left and right at least shows us a head, but the head is going in the wrong direction, which is very easy to address. Because all we have to do is to change the flip x to the inverse value. So true and false. And now let's try this again. And now for left and right, we have the head of our snake. Nice. Oh, and for up and down, this is not up, this is top, and down is bottom. So now let's try this again. And... Well, we get something at least now. But what you can see now this is that I have picked the wrong element. But that's not a problem. So this one is supposed to be three because we start counting at zero. So now let's try it again. And, ah, we are almost there. I just inverted them. Final step, this has to be false and true. And now let's try it. There we go. This feels much better. So I think you can already tell this is going to be a lot of if and else statements. And when I set up the entire system, I went a lot with trial and error to figure out in what way each element has to point. Which can be quite confusing, but if you work with this for a little bit, it actually gets fairly straightforward. And now that we have the head, we can take the tail actually super easily because it's the exact same logic except on the other part. So now to target the tail, I want if block index is equal to snake body dot size and minus one. So this one is always going to give us the last element in our snake. And for this one, I want to create a new variable that I call tail direction. And here again, I can use my relation to function. And I want to place in here snake body minus one. So the last element and then snake body minus two. So the element before the last element. And once I have that, I can just copy the entire part for the head and paste it in here because it's the exact same logic. Except now I have to rename a couple of things. Or let me call this head here instead of head direction. It's going to make the entire thing a good bit more compact. So, tail direction. Oh, and an important part is that this has to be an L if statement. So the entire thing is going to work and we don't overwrite the original one with this else statement down here. So let's actually try how this is going to look. And now, well, I guess this is some kind of snake game. Could be a fun multiplayer game, but well, it's up to you. Okay, so instead of getting a head, I want to get a tail to make this thing look decent. And I have to tailor position 0, 0 and 0, 1. So this is going to be 0, 0. And this is 0 and 1. And 0 and 1. And we probably have to adjust it. So let's have a look. So it is working, but each direction is exactly the wrong way. But the entire logic else is still working fine. Cool. So all we have to do is for the left and the right, is to invert the horizontal direction. So instead of true for x flipped, this is going to be false. And for false, this is going to be true. And then for top and bottom, the false for y flip has to be true. And the true for the bottom has to be false. 
And now let's try the entire thing again. And there we go. We have the head and the tail of our snake and they work perfectly fine. Let's say one more and yeah, this is working really well. Nice. So with that, we have the head and let me put it away and we have the tail and let's move that away as well. So now we can start working on all the parts in between. And so far, we only had to know one neighbor for each block. So for the head, we had to know the block that came before it. And for the tail, we had to know the block that came after it. But for all the middle parts, we need to know the block that came before it and the block that came after it. So even more logic to make all of this work. But again, let's work through it step by step. So here I'm back in my code. And I want to put all of this inside of an else statement. And because of that, I also move all of this in there as well. And the first thing we have to get here is to get the actual position of the previous and of the next block. And I'm going to store both of them in their own variable. So let's call this previous block. And I want var next block. And previous block is going to be snake body and I want my block index and it's going to be plus one. And we can do the very same thing for the next block, except now that this has to be minus one. So this way we have a block ourselves, our main block here, and then we have a previous block and the next block. And the relation between these three blocks is going to tell us what kind of block we need for the block itself. Although there's one more change I want to make, that I don't want the block itself, I want the block's relationship with our current block. And for that, all I have to do is to subtract the block itself. So minus block. And this is going to give us exactly the same thing that we have seen down here. That we're just going to subtract one block from the other. And unfortunately, we couldn't use this function anymore because we are going to need a bit more information from these blocks. But okay. Let's do some more if statements. And for now, I want to work on all the blocks that are either horizontal or vertical, because these are quite easy to get. And really, all we have to know here is that if our previous block and our next block have the same x position, then we know it's going to be a vertical block. And if they have the same y values, then they are going to be a horizontal block. So really, all we have to do is if previous block dot x is equal to next block, next block dot x. And if that is the case, let me copy the entire set cell method again. So these three stay the same every single time. But now I want to cover the vertical cell, which is going to be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So for 0 and for 1 are the vertical and the horizontal cell. So this is going to be four and one. And now I can copy the entire thing. And I just want to check the Y attributes. And if they are true, then this is going to be four and zero. And let's try this now. And there we go. If we're going just left and right, this is already looking really good. But if you're going up and down, something is going wrong. So let's investigate that part. And again, the reason for this problem is that I forgot to set an L if statement. So that this one did actually work. But the problem is that then Godot went with this statement and then used the else statement and painted over this initial if statement. So that's why it didn't work. But now with an L if statement, this is only going to run if neither of these work out. So now let's try it. And there we go. If we go all the way horizontal or vertical, then this is working really well. So all we have to do now is to figure out the corners. And this is arguably the most complex part of this entire thing. So let's talk through it very slowly. And all of this is going to end up in another else statement. And let me get rid of this bit here entirely now because we're not going to need it anymore. For the corners, we have all the information we need to draw the right one. But we do have to think about the logic here quite a bit. 
So let's use an example. Let's say we have one block in position 5 and 10. And then we have one block to the right at position 6 and 10. And then one block above this block. So at position 5 and 9. And let's say the one to the right is the next block and the one on top is the previous block. And all we have to check now is next block.x is equal to 1 and previous block.y is equal to minus 1. But we have to check these blocks from two different positions. So the snake could either come from the right and go upwards, or the snake could come from the top and go to the right. So when we check the relation between these blocks, we have to check both possibilities. And that's pretty much it. It probably is going to be quite complicated, so I would recommend going over this a couple of times. But let me actually implement it. So let's start if previous block dot x is equal to minus one and next block dot y is also equal to minus one. So we have a block to the left and a block above. But we also have to check the or that if next block dot x and previous block dot y both equal to minus one. Then we're going the same corner, but the other direction. But if either of these are true, then we just want to draw a corner. So again, I copy snake apple. All of these still stay the same. But now I'm going to copy, I think this is number five. And let me open our tile map again. So now I want these four blocks here that are the different corners. It's going to be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So I have 5, 6, 5, 1, and 6, 1. And these are the blocks I want to target now. And I will probably have to work around with these different ones. So let's see how far we get with this one. So it's still working, but now if I get around the corner, we can see that we're going up and to the left, or we're going down and to the right. So what we have to do is to flip both of these to true. And that way, if we're going right and up, we have a proper corner. Nice. So now I can copy these two lines. And again, copy them four times for each different possibility. And now I want previous block that x is minus 1. And I want to go with minus 1 and 1. And then for the next block, x is still minus 1. And previous block dot y is just going to be 1. And if that is the case, I think I just have to flip this one around. So now instead of going right and up, we're going right and down. And let's try this. So now we can go right and up and right and down. Nice. And we can also get top and left because it's the same corner. So this starts to come together quite well. Nice. Oops, that wasn't intentional. Okay, now we can cover the next one where we have x is one and y is negative one and next block is going to be one and previous block is going to be minus one. And I think for this one, we have to flip around the previous one entirely. So this is false and true. And let's try this one now. And seems to be working. Nice. And every other part is still working perfectly fine. Cool. And now for the final one, we just go with one and one and one and one. And for this one, I think both have to be false. And this is pretty much it. Let's try it now. And we have a fully functioning snake. Nice. And yeah, I think this works really well. So I assume if you look at this entire block here, even further up, all the way up till here, 
this is quite a bit of advanced coding, or at least, let's say, slightly more advanced. So I would really recommend to go over this a couple of times and ideally draw all of the vectors. It is really good to visualize how all of these relate to each other. And honestly, when I laid out the entire logic by myself, I just draw them out and went by trial and error. Because just doing all of this in your head is really complicated. But if you understand the basic logic, all of this actually becomes really simple. But okay, now we have finished our drawing snake function. So I can close it and not worry about it again. But now while we're at it, let me go back to the scene again. We don't have a background, which, well, would be kind of nice to add. And for this one, I was quite lazy because I already have the grass background and all I have to do is to add a texture rectangle and put it behind our snake tile map and place it in there. And we have two blocks. And these are also 40 by 40 pixels. So they are already covering the same block size. And now all I really have to do is to go to layout and click on full rect. And then in the inspector, click on expand and stretch mode is supposed to be tile. And that way we get the entire background. So let's try it now. And there we have a much better looking game. So this is already getting much, much better. So very nice. And we are actually quite close to finishing the entire game. The one thing left to do is to talk about the score and to add some sounds. And that's pretty much it. Both of these are really easy to get. So let's start with the score. And all we have to do to get the score is to measure the length of our snake body array. Because every time our snake eats an apple, this one gets longer by one unit. And then we just have to display that number minus our starting length, which is super easy to do. So let's jump right in. So here I am back in my main game scene. And to get our score, I want to put all of this into a new scene that I will just put down as a 2D scene. And let's call this one score, seems like a good name. And for now, all I want to put in here is a label that I will call score text. And by default, just so we can see it, let's put a zero in there. So now if I zoom all the way in, we can see our zero. And furthermore, I can give it a custom font on the right under custom fonts. I give it a dynamic font and I click on it again and I click on font and drag in poets in one, the font I had in my font folder. And now this is looking a little bit nicer. And while we're at it, I also change the color of the font. So I go to custom colors and click on font color. It's not supposed to be black. Instead, the font hexadecimal is 3, 8, 4, A, 0, and C which is a dark greenish color, which I think works well with the theme. And since I want to reuse it, I click on the plus in the bottom here, and now I saved it. So we can reuse it later. And now I have the number, and I want to save this scene. I am also going to do this in the main folder, and score is still the fine name. And now back in our main game, I am just going to put an instance of this score as a child to our main game. And now if I run the entire scene, I can see the zero in the top left. It doesn't do anything right now, but we are going to take care of that right now. And let me explain how I want to do that. I am going to put my score scene into a group, and this group is going to have an update method. And every time our snake eats an apple, I'm going to trigger this update method and pass in the length of our snake. And that way we can update the score every time the snake eats an apple. So we are going to use a very simple group setup for Godot to make all of this work. So back in the editor, I go to score and with my score selected, I go to node and groups and I'm going to give it a group and let's call this score group. And now you can see the icon next to score. And besides that, I also want to give it a script. And I'm going to leave all of this, let's leave it empty, seems fine. And now in here, 
I have to create a new function that I call update score. And this update score is going to take one argument that I'm going to call snake length. And then all I want to do is to get my score text dot text. And this is going to be a string of the snake length. So literally all that happens in here is that whenever we call this method, we are taking our score text and setting the string of the text to whatever the snake length is going to be. And now that we have that, we can go back to our main game scene. And let me clean this up a little bit so it looks a little bit neater. Okay, this looks better. There we go. Okay, now in our function for check apple eaten, I'm going to open this one. And every time this is happening, all I want to do is get tree and call group. And I want to call my score group. And inside of that score group, the method I want to call, I called update score. Or at least I think I did. Uh, yes, I did. And the argument I want to pass into it is snake body dot size. And now with that, this should theoretically be working. Let's try. So I run the game, it still shows zero. And now whenever I eat the first apple, we get three. We're gonna fix that in a second. But if I eat another apple, we get to four. And then we get to five. And let's try one more just to be sure. And we get to six. Cool, so this is working. And now the only problem with the score is that when we eat our first apple, we don't go to one, instead we are going to three. And the reason for that, is that our snake body by default has three vectors inside. And then when we eat the first apple, this size is supposed to be four, but we only update the snake body after this is run. But since all of that is constant, all I have to do is to get my snake length and subtract two, and that's pretty much it. So now let me get back to my main game and let's try this again. Now we still start at zero, and if I now go up, we get to one and then we will get to two and so on. So this is working nice and well. Cool, so now we have a score. And all we really have done here is that we have taken the length of our snake minus the starting position with some minor adjustments. So what we have to do now, let me run the game again is that we have to place the score in a nicer position because I don't want it to be this random number in the top left of the screen. And we could approach this topic in a couple of different ways. One way would be to use control nodes, and this would be a perfectly valid way, but I'm not going to use it. Instead, I'm going to write some code to place the text in the bottom right, for the simple reason that the game is really simple and static, so we don't really need any kind of fancy setup. So let's have a look at this. So I go back to my score scene, and the first thing I want to do is to add another sprite. And this is going to be the apple because I want to have an apple next to my score. So in graphics, I'm going to drag my apple as a texture in there. So now we have an apple and the text. And let me rename the sprite to apple. And now I have to set up the entire thing in code. And the first thing I need is the actual screen dimensions. So I need to know how large the window is to play something in the bottom right. And for that, when the scene is ready, I want to create a new variable that I have called screen size. And to get the screen size, or more specifically the viewport size, I need get viewport dot size. And this is going to give us a vector that shows the X and the Y dimensions of our viewport. And now, once our entire scene is ready, I want to use that information to place the apple and to score. And let's start with the apple. I think that's a bit easier to illustrate. So I want to get my apple and I want to set the position. And for the position, I'm going to need a vector two. And in here, I need an X and a Y position. And I have both of them. It's just the screen size dot X and screen size dot y. But now if I run this entire scene, 
we can see that we can't see the top left of the apple, but the center of the apple is in the corner of the screen. So this is no good. So I have to move both of these a bit further to the left and a bit up. And the numbers I have come up with are 60 and 40. And now if I run the scene, we can see the apple in the bottom right. So this one looks quite nice. And with that, I want to get my score text and do the same thing to it. With one difference, that we couldn't just place the position of the text because this one is a control node. So instead what we have to do is to get the rect position. And once we have that, we can do the same thing we have done to the apple position. So this one also takes a vector 2, vector 2. And I can literally just copy the entire coordinates for the apple and move them slightly further to the right. So instead of minus 60, I go to minus 40. And then I also place the y position a bit further up, so 50. And let's try this now. And it's very hard to see because we have a gray background, but you can see the zero there very faintly. But if I go back to my main game scene, and let me actually set up a main scene. So main game. If I run this, you can see it much better. And the score also still works. So this is all coming together quite nicely. The only problem now is that I think there should be some kind of background behind the score, because just having the apple and this text on the screen, well, it looks a bit weird. So what I want to do is to draw on the screen. And this, fortunately, we can do very easily. All I need is the func underscore draw method. And in here, we can draw a method that is called draw rect. And this one is going to need two arguments at the minimum. The first one is a rect 2D and the second one is a color. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a BG rect in just a second. And to create color, I just have to write color. And here we have three different options. We have just color, we have color 8, which stands for color 8 bit. And then we have color N, which stands for color name. I want to go with color 8. And in here, we have to pass in three numbers, the amount of red, the amount of green, and the amount of blue. And for each of those, we have to get a number between 0 and 255, with 0 being the absence of the color and 255 being the full amount of the color. So for example, for red, I want 166, which is a bit more than 50% of red. Then I want 209 for green, and I want 60 for blue. So for this color, we have a lot of green, a bit less red, and very little blue. So this would cover the color itself, but now we have to create the actual rectangle we want to draw. So I want to create var bg rect, and this has to be a rect2. And for this rect2d, we either have to pass in two vector2ds, one vector2d for the position and one vector2d for the size, or we just pass in four different numbers that are for x, y, width, and height. I'm going to go with the second approach because I have used way too many vectors in the last hour. So let's work through them. The first one is the x position. And I have the x position. For now, it's just apple.position.x. This isn't going to be perfect, but for now, it is good enough. Next up, I want the y position. And this is also going to be the apple.position, except now it's going to be y. And now I need the width and the height. For the width, at least for now, I'm just going to go with 100. And for the height, since I know that the apple is 40 pixels high, I am just going to go with 40. And now if I run this entire game, um, well, it is there, but it is very hard to see. So let me close this game and let me just open the scene by itself. Ah, so this is much easier to see. So now we can see that we have placed the top left of this rectangle in the center of our apple. So it's a start, but it's not perfect. Let's fix it. Since I know that the apple is 40 pixels wide and 40 pixels high, all I have to do is to subtract 20 from the x and the y position. And with that, we should already have a much better rectangle. Nice. So this one is looking quite a bit better already. But now the problem is, for the width, I don't want a generic number. Instead, I want to combine the width of the apple and the width of the text. 
And let me put this into its own variable just so it's a bit clearer. So let's call this var score width. And how I am going to get this is I'm going to get my apple. I am going to go with get rect, which is going to give us a rectangle of the outlines of the apple. And of this rectangle, I want the size. And this is going to give us a vector with the x and the y dimension. And of that, I only want the x one. So this entire line is going to give us 40, because I already know that my apple is 40 pixels high and 40 pixels wide. And towards that, I want to get my score text and do the same thing. So get rect, then I want the size, and then I want the x value of the size. And that's all I needed. So now I can type in score width. And let's try the entire thing now. So now something weird happened that this entire rectangle is too wide. But all we have to do to fix it is to subtract a few pixels from this rectangle. In my case, I went with 16. And let me actually add it all the way up here. So minus 16. And now if I run it, now we get a proper rectangle. And I really don't know why Godot makes this much longer than it's supposed to be. It might be a problem with the font, I really can't tell. If you know, let me know in the comments. But okay, now we have a proper rectangle that we can work with. And what we can also do is if I copy the entire rectangle, I can add one more argument for false. And this argument here is the fill argument. And by default, it's true. So since we didn't pass anything in here, this is true. And if this one is true, Godot is filling the rectangle. However, if this one is set to false, Godot is only drawing a frame around the rectangle. So let me illustrate this by just adding 0 and 0 and 0 in here. So now we should be drawing a black frame around the rectangle. And let's try this. And there we go. It's a little bit hard to see. Let me run the actual game. This is much better to see. So now we have a black rectangle around the score. That makes it much easier to see. And all of this is coming together quite well. Nice. But now for the color, I want to use 56 for red. I want to use 74 for green. And I want to use 12 for blue. And this is going to be the exact same color as our text. So now if I run all of this, this is starting to look a bit nicer. Cool, so now we have our score. And all of this is working really well. So all is good. And with that covered, we can finish the game by adding a sound and fixing some minor bugs. And let's start with the sound. That is the super easy part. So here I'm back in my main game scene. And all I have to do is to add a new node that is going to be an audio stream player. And I have called this crunch sound. And into this, I am adding my crunch sound. And now we have a sound we can work with. And really all I have to do is if my apple is eaten, I am also going to call this. So I just target my crunch sound and click on play. So let's try this one now. And I can hear a crunch sound. So that is the really easy part. Cool. And right now, there's one possible bug that can be quite annoying. Since we're placing the apple randomly on the screen, there's a small chance that the apple lands exactly on the body of the snake, which, well, I don't want. But fortunately, this is very easily fixed. All we have to do in our process function is when the apple is overlapping with the body of the snake, then we want to reposition the apple. And once we have that, we have finished the game. So let's jump right in and finish the game. All right, so here we are back in the editor. And I want to go back to my code and move all the way to the bottom to my process function. And in here, all I have to do is check if my apple pause in snake body. And if that is the case, I want to get my apple pause and place it in another random position, which we already can do with the place apple function. And well, that is literally it. This is all we had to do. 
So now whenever we are running, let me find it. Whenever we're running check apple eaten and replace the apple, then we also check if the apple lands somewhere on the snake. And if that is the case, we want to reposition the apple. And we want to do this immediately. So it has to be in the process function. And now let me run the game to see if it still works. And this still seems fine. We can also eat the apple. And well, that's it. So this should be a fairly decent snake game. So I hope you enjoyed this and I will see you around.